This program has been made possible in part by the following sponsors. The Trial Lawyers Association of B.C. The Vancouver Courier Newspaper. My new book about addictions, All the Way Home, Building Recovery That Works. Crime continues to be a major headline story in the ever-expanding city of Surrey. And it's gotten so far that uh, we now have citizen protests and citizen organizations seeing what they can do about it. People, frankly, are afraid. Uh, not too long ago, in the spring, three uh, very active NDP MLAs from the Surrey uh, area uh, held a, a public event. Uh, uh, it was packed, and it was about... Uh, rogue recovery homes, about methadone dispensing recovery homes, and related issues. And many, many people, a matter of disclosure, including myself, got up and said a few words. Uh, we're delighted to have with us today uh, one of those uh, organizers, Sue Hamill, who is uh, MLA for uh, Surrey Green Timbers, I think. That's right. Yeah, yes, That's yes. right. So, Sue, then in May, uh, you stood up in the House and you challenged uh, Minister Lake, the health minister, about these very issues. So give us give us the background. I mean, what led you and Harry and who is the third person? Bruce Ralston. Yeah, Bruce Ralston. So forgive me for forgetting that. Uh, Harry Baines, right? Yes, that's right. The three right. of you, what led you, spurred you to say, okay, we've got we've to put this out in front of the public? Well, we've had um, a number of deaths in Surrey, yes. murders, in fact. Yep. And this was, to some extent, triggered by one of the worst, and that was Julie Pascal, who died just outside of the Newton Arena. And we first start, started what was called the Surrey Accord, and what yes. we wanted, um, the federal government and the provincial government and the municipal government, to sit down and discuss some of the issues that uh, centered around crime. And why um, our city of Surrey is so um, in the in the hot spot and how and why we in Surrey feel that we're not safe. In fact, I talked to someone the other day who said that 16 percent. The the polling says 16 percent of the people of Surrey think crime is being handled appropriately, and they they um, so that means 84 percent don't feel safe. Right. And so part of that is, part of the accord was looking at the recovery house system. Yes. And so we have, we have people who are addicted, who have mental health issues, um, who are needing a place to stay, and we have excellent facilities right through to um, facilities that are atrocious. Yes. That we would be shocked and appalled if any of our children or our neighbors' children our families, youth, or even older people got into. They're um, awful, awful places. On the, pl on the plus side, Surrey, under Diane Watts' leadership, has been uh, very proactive in, in, say, in welcoming innovative and interesting and progressive, uh, 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 not only recovery homes, but other kinds of institutions that are doing wonderful work. Absolutely. But they are few and far between. That's There's right. a handful of them. Mm -hmm. And then there are these places you call atrocious. Describe atrocious. Well, atrocious, um, one person who was in them described one house as having 22 people yes. in the house, yes. um, with the cook having $500 a month to feed 22 people. Excuse me? And so the, the landlord or the person running the recovery home, the master, the, the major yeah, yeah. person in terms of the recovery house, is taking the money from people who come there. They're on social assistance. They have a shelter apportion. So um, they're taking that money and then it's just being used, just coin past them into the back pocket. And they're not actually serving 
the people who come. So they're taking advantage of the people who are most marginalized in our community and further marginali marginalizing them by um, taking their money and not um, appropriately uh, caring for them or providing the service that they have deemed they should. Sometimes they'll get somebody in, they'll take their check, and then for some reason kick them out. They're then without a home without a place to stay. They have no money. They can't go back and get more social assistance. But the problem is these are rogue. And I wouldn't even call them recovery houses. No, they're not. They're not. They're flop well, houses you say or they're crack shacks. When, when, yeah, when you say for some reason they, they, you know, they take someone's welfare check and then uh, for some reason they throw them out, the reason is simple. They can get an ex person with another That's welfare right. check. That's right. It's about so, money. Yeah, and it's... Um, it's, um, um, it's, it, it, it's evil, criminal. it's creepy. <laughs> but because you're, you're, you're preying on That's right. extremely vulnerable, weakened people. That's right. You know, who are weakened by their, all of their life circumstances and by drug habits and alcoholism and so on. And so they're not in the best shape to make great decisions. Yeah. And what they need is support. That's right. Yes, they need to be confronted with their bad behavior and so on, but mostly they need support. I, I visited Sue, uh, a place I wasn't aware of until recently. I visited a couple weeks ago, and immediately I saw the guy had programmed like crazy. He had stuff going on all the time. He has three houses. Uh, he, he showed me the, the stores, meaning the food supplies, and I was in the kitchen. I mean, it's a, it's a terrific operation. Not fancy, not super wealthy. Yeah. It, it doesn't cost, you know, 20 or 30 grand to, to get in there, but very good, good programming. Yeah, well, there are some fabulous programs. Um, I can think of the Realistic Recovery Society. They have three houses. They have just been awarded um, some money from Van City to help them secure a home, good. one of the homes. Yeah. Um, they are, do fabulous work in the community. The Launching Pad is another one. They do great work, great work. And they are the kind of houses that we need to support, we need to model after, to um, re repeat this kind of, of care and concern in our community. So the question remains, how do we, let's stay with Surrey, cause, but we could use this as the model okay. for anywhere. Yep. How do we go around and say, okay, House A, Site A is working, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a positive, contributor to the community. House B is a pile of crap and we're closing it down. How do we do that? Well, I think you have to do that through bylaws, uh -huh. through the city bylaws. Um, and, and, you know, to Surrey's credit, they have been trying to do that. Uh, but it is a little bit like, what, what do you call that game, whack-a-mole? <laughs> if, you, if you hit one, it'll pop it pops up, up somewhere, somewhere else. else. Yeah. Because, in, um, and those are the bad ones, right, we're talking about. Yes. Um, because there is a need, like there's a market. There are people that need housing, and if they're at the end of the line, they'll take anything. Sue, let's be honest about something. I, I've been in, in and out of the recovery business most of my life. The recovery business is a billion dollar industry. That's right. You know, and, right. and so there's lots of people who run legitimate uh, for-profit clinics all over the world. There's lots of people who run legitimate not-for-profit uh, recovery centers all over the world, you know, and then there's lots of these lunatics. And there's lots of people um, talking about a billion dollar industry yes. who are making money on methadone. They're making money on um, you know, the drugs they prescribe to addicts. Like there's a whole, there's a big industry. Describe, describe around. if you will, the methadone scam in Surrey. Well, how does um, it work? Well, if, there, if the scam is operating at its worst, and this is what um, has been reported and been described to me, yes. it's alleged that um, a methadone clinic or person who owns a methadone um, prescription uh, pharmacy yes. uh, will also be connected to the recovery house and then the recovery house people sometimes are put in a truck or not a truck I mean a, a van, van yeah. right driven to get their methadone yes. and there's a kickback system that goes on between the pharmacy and the um, the, the flop house, I just refuse to call them a, yes. um, a, give them a more elevated language, but the flop house or the drug house or the place where people are staying and on methadone. 
And this is, um, you know, it, it's very difficult to pin down. There was one pharmacist who was accused of doing this. He went in front of the college, the board of yes, um, the, pharmacists. Yes, the college of pharmacists. And it just takes forever to go through the process to um, to deal with these issues. And it's interesting you raise that because in your questions, which we'll focus on a bit more after our break, in your questions to Minister Lake in the House in May, well, that's one of the things he fell back on. And he, in his response to you, his response was, was a little, frankly, a little loose and flaky. But he said, well, you know, the College of Pharmacists, you know, keeps a good eye on this. No, they don't. Of course they don't. No. I mean, it's a very complicated um, era, area yes. for people to keep their eye on. Any processes take a long time and go through um, a, a fair amount of review. So, no, I, I think it, it's much more complicated than... So a good friend of ours, uh, we both know him, who runs a terrific program, uh, and uh, several of his houses are in Surrey, uh, Langley, and so on, but he has places all over the province. I think it has about 200 beds. Uh, he told me on the phone only two days ago, because we're always speaking about something, about the pharmacist who offered him $9 per person. Yes. Uh, get, the, get the methadone from me. Yeah, and our buddy said, we don't do methadone. Thanks for dropping by. Nice to see you. Yeah. But we, that's not what we do. Mm -hmm. That's a kickback. Right? Yeah, that's a kickback. But you see, yeah. the, some of these pharmacists do nothing but methadone. Yes. Like, they're not a, a normal retail pharmacy. They specifically um, uh, specialize in methadone. And therefore, it's, it's they need to support their business, right. to um, get clients. and Gee, I'm so confused. I thought methadone was supposed to save us from heroin, and it turns out it's being used as a contraband, illegal <laughs> trade in itself. That's Isn't right. that fun? Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, we've, we've been misled somehow. Yeah. Well, it's, um, it's certainly, there's certainly serious questions about yes. um, whether it should be the first line of defense or first line of um, action in terms of addiction. I think that we, um, as a community, need to really look at if we, if somebody has an illness through addiction or mental illness, we have to, um, I don't think our first response should be to give them another drug that they, then, they, they depend on. I think we have to be looking. You're a rare bird, you know that. No, because I know, that's, I, that's I know. the knee-jerk reaction, oh, have a pill. Yeah, no, no, I, but I think, um, Dave, there is going to be a lot of new, um, new ways of responding to things as we know more and more about our brains. I hope so, I hope so. We'll take a little breather, give our brains a rest for four seconds. Sounds good. And uh, we'll be back in a moment with Sue Hamill, MLA for Surrey uh, Green Timbers. Now, uh, your opportunity to say hi at davidburner.com and a chance for those lovely folks uh, to say hello, those people who support us here on Shaw Community Television Cable 4. We'll be back with you as soon as our brains recover. This program has been made possible in part by the following sponsors. The Trial Lawyers Association of BC. The Vancouver Courier Newspaper. My new book about addictions, All the Way Home, Building Recovery That Works. Surrey Green Timbers uh, member of the legislature, Sue Hamill, is with us, and in uh, the spring, uh, she asked Minister Lake, the health minister, a question and then a supplemental uh, about uh, recovery homes and methadone and so on. And one of the things you pointed out was that the Liberal government of the time, I guess this was the Campbell government at the mm -hmm. time, mm -hmm. deregulated the recovery home system in 2002. Now deregulation 
in, in governments worldwide is a standard ploy of uh, mostly capitalist, right-wing uh, people who free enterprise and so on. And we understand that often you know, deregulation in industry can make sense That's or it can cause havoc. Okay, we can look at, we look at airplanes, look at television, and make determinations about those. But you have said that in deregulating the recovery home system, it went into chaos. You see, one of the issues I've always thought, Sue Hamill, in when a government deregulates an industry, that's fine as long as they have uh, a diligence in oversight, as long as they have real oversight and they have real inspectors. We don't have inspectors at mushroom farms. We don't have inspectors at mines, in our mines. The Poli mine is yes. an exact, a, a classic example of deregulation. That when it when you deregulate and you have very little oversight, yes. and something goes wrong. It hurts the people who've deregulated. This has hurt the mining industry. And the simple reason is that as soon as you deregulate, the folks who are in the business want more business. That's understandable. That's what businesses are about. Higher profit margin. Yeah, of course. We, we get that. That's, Absolutely. That's obvious. And shareholders want higher, higher profits and better dividends. Fair enough. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but there's something wrong with it when men are killed in mines. There's something wrong with it when dams collapse and when uh, tailings fall into lakes. And there's something wrong with it when recovery homes spring up on every street corner in Surrey and there are shams. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that regulation is like the rules of engagement. <laughs> yes, yes. Right? These yeah, yeah. are the rules yes, that yes, we yes, operate yes. under. Yeah. We operate under rules everywhere. We yes. don't go roaring down the street. Red lights. Speed yeah. limits, yeah. all kinds of things. They're just the rules of engagement. Yes. And they provide a base through which we will not fall. And, and, and so in, when you deregulate. You, have, you, you can fall forever. Yes. You, there's no bottom, or the bottom is just as much as you can gouge out of the most marginalized in terms of the regu of deregulating the recovery house. So the good minister says, well, you know, uh, we are committed to make sure the taxpayers' money for health care services are used wisely. Uh, we could do two hours on that sentence alone, That's because right. both you and I, I think, I think we agree that one of the most difficult players in all of this scenario are the health, the, the health authorities who make things very, very difficult for recovery work. Yeah. Well, the health authorities in Surrey is involved in Phoenix. Yes. And they are involved in Creekside and yeah. in a few other um, where they do a lot of the, the, the funding of those. The social, um, the social development minister is yes. involved in a very, what I call, soft form of regulation of recovery houses, um, and th those are the ones that meet some kind of standard. So they um, supply $30.90 a day yes. for those recovery houses if they meet certain standards. And so, but the problem is, they're not, um, the complaint, it's complaint driven, there's not regular inspections. Exactly. It just, it's, it's a kind of soft, so, so, Boy, so it's right. interesting that in the in your reask in your supplemental, the minister came back with something that you and I would agree with, except how much does he really understand of this? He says there are remedies available to local governments, and I think you just said before yeah. the break, you said I think municipalities can do something about this. Uh, the the and then oddly. He gives the example of Abbotsford as a shining example when it, if you know anything, Abbotsford's the worst example. Right. Abbotsford's a disaster in terms of mental health and drug addiction. That's right. You know? Yeah. And and their attitude also. And their right. attitude towards it. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. so let's look at that. My question then is, did you have you and Harry and and um, Sorry, help Bruce, me again. Bruce, Bruce, have the three of you or anybody in your caucus sat down with the current Surrey administration and, and said, okay, look, how are we going to tackle this? 
We have, we, um, now that goes back to the accord yes. that we talked yes, about yes. at the beginning of the meeting. We have asked that not only the federal, the provincial, and the municipal sit down together and take a, a broad look at the crime in crime issues in Surrey yes. and have a slice look at this particular piece. Yes. After our meeting, which yes, you were at. the public meeting was great. The, yeah, yep. it, there was um, a real work um, done and a press release put out by the, the municipality saying they had shut down a number of recovery homes. The problem is, David, if you shut down a recovery home that's a bad one, where do the people go? If you shut them all down, they're on the street. People don't want people on the street. They're happier with people inside a recovery house system. But let me illustrate the irony of all this, okay? We've got a guy who's a multimillionaire who, who, who uh, is a very religious, spiritual guy, and out of the goodness of his heart, he's turned all of his energies into philanthropic work. He made and his millions enough already. He opens a hospital a week, practically, in Africa, okay? Now he has a huge recovery center in, 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 in Surrey. <coughs> now, I've been to it, it's fabulous. Yeah, and he's about to build, he's finishing, almost finishing building a, 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 a project for 100 people. He's got about 36 at the moment. Now, you're right. Shut down House B that's, that's a mess, right? Where do they go? He could accommodate them. That program could accommodate people tomorrow. But the health authority hates him. They think he's a cult. He's not a cult. He's, he's running a great program. Yeah. I know the guy intimately. I know his program intimately. Yeah. It's excellent. And I've been to a graduation at, yes. at the facility. Yes. And I was just, um, I was so impressed and so um, engaged by the whole um, whole hour I spent there. It was, it was absolutely fabulous. Sure. So, um, so what happens is we get into discussions around houses that don't accept methadone yes. and houses that do. A lot of the houses that I know that are um, like the Realistic Recovery Society or um, the Welcome Home, which is the one we're talking yeah. about, um, at least as the last time I spoke with them, they didn't, they, they're not uh, methadone friendly. Right. And that, I think, is where the, the rubber hits the road. Why, why do the health authorities have the authority to set this kind of policy? That's none of their business. The, why are they saying to the John Vulcans of the world and, and, and the, the Jim O'Rourke's of the world, people who do abstinence-based recovery work, why are they saying, we won't support you until you give people methadone? Yeah, I mean... They, I, they, they say... They say, we believe in a continuum of care, but they don't really believe in a continuum of care. They don't believe that abstinence works. Well, they, um, I mean, everyone knows that abstinence works. Yeah. It doesn't probably work for everyone. Everyone except the health authorities. But it certainly works for yeah. a great number of people. Of and it seems to me that the more choices people are given in terms of a, a path to recovery, the better off we are. And one of them has to be an abstinence-based program. And, uh, and I also think that we should be very cautious about substituting one drug for another drug. Good for you. Uh, I have a question. Do you believe there's something going on that I don't quite buy into? Do you believe that mental health and addictions belong in the same basket? Yeah, I do. Why? Tell me. Um, because I think... Um, they're, they are often concurrent diseases. Yes, yeah. And that uh, you need to treat both. You need to be... So, for example, David, and, and it was in the paper the other, other day, 56% of the correct people in, incarcerated yes. in British Columbia yeah. have mental health and addiction. Absolutely, problems. absolutely. So it, it's... Uh, Here's a simple fact of life. This is an economic fact of life. Some wag said it a few years ago, and he was right. The, in terms of addictions, the poor get methadone and the rich get private clinics. That's correct. And I, work at, and I work at a private clinic one day a week where people pay out of their own pockets a small fortune, and very few people who come there have mental disorders. Mm -hmm. they're, they're people with addictions. Mm -hmm. They're alcoholics, uh, you know, meth heads, whatever, whatever they use, you know. Well, you know, I think we're going to find, 
when we do more study on yes. the brain, which yeah, <laughs> I yeah. just, I think there's a whole new world coming that we will understand much, in a much more profound way, the causes of mental illness and the causes of, of addictions and, you know, the causes of all habits. Um, Is there a pill to cure politicians? I don't think so, David. <laughs> <laughs> I've never found one. I'm not cured. <laughs> you know, I think uh, we just have a minute and a half to wrap. Okay. So, so, Sue, tell me, if you were the leader of the free world, what would you be doing on this issue? Oh, I would be, um, I would be putting a lot more attention into a path of recovery. I would be. That's the crowd on its feet cheering. Uh, yes. Yeah. yes. No, I think that 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 is the most um, productive in the end. And I know it's difficult, and I know the numbers aren't great, yep. but that's where you have to go to get people out the other is end. This a, is this an issue that even people in your own party, that politicians in general just find to be a pain in the ass? No. Be, because it's kind of, you know, it's a sidebar, and we, we have other bigger issues. And... No, I, I think that if you looked at mental health and yes. addictions, yes. you would find them extremely costly to the public purse. Absolutely. And it's in our best interest as politicians to address those issues. Beautiful. Well said. Good closer. Thank you so much, Sue okay. Hamill. That was great. great. That was great. Yeah. All right, next week, I haven't named our guest, but I can tell you the issue. The issue is, why are we spending a lot of money training firefighters to be paramedics? Why don't we just hire more paramedics? We're hoping to have someone from the paramedics gang to talk about that. In the meantime, thanks for being with us here on Shaw Community Television Cable 4. Good night. Lovely stuff. <laughs>